Hello and welcome to the ERP Organizational Change Journal Podcast, brought to you by Nestle & Associates. Nestle & Associates is an ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. I'm your co-host, Jonathan Donald, the founder of Invert Ventures, a change strategy firm, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Jack Nestle, the founder of Nestle & Associates, and the host of the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast. The ERP Organizational Change Journal seeks to share expertise, insight, and create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success, expanding what we can see so we can act in a more effective way. We seek to promote, connect, and foster relationships in the ERP organizational change community. The primary purpose of this podcast is to discuss, share, and reflect upon effective and efficient ways in which to realize ERP organizational change success. We will discuss the people, process, and technological components of ERP organizational change. This podcast is intended as a forum to study, share, and discuss ERP organizational change. It's our intention for this to be a collaboration tool and resource. We hope that you find this podcast useful as we share lessons learned, discover best practices, and explore the human elements and components of ERP organizational change. Our podcast draws on knowledge from extensive research, collaborative learning, practitioner experience of both project successes and project failures. A general review of the themes of ERP and organizational change practice, literature, and research suggests that understanding and critically having an awareness of tactics founded in principle is fundamental to ERP organizational change success. Our podcast will discuss these tactics, explore these approaches, and discover the principles that they are founded upon so that they may prove to be useful in addressing ERP organizational change challenges and risks. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm always so excited and looking forward to fun conversations with you and our guest. Uh, We seek to promote, connect, and foster relationships in the ERP organizational change community. As we are a podcast that desires to engage in valuable insight into the world of ERP organizational change success with interviews and roundtable talk, our guests include experts and pioneers in the field, organizational stakeholders, practitioners, and researchers. Our podcast is a platform for those seeking to share, learn, and reflect on ERP organizational change success. In today's episode, our topic is Modern ERP, Select, Implement, and Use Today's Advanced Business Systems with Dr. Bradford. Dr. Bradford is a full professor in the Department of Accounting at North Carolina State University's Poole College of Management, where she teaches ERP systems and has written a core textbook on ERP systems called The Modern ERP, Select, Implement, and Use Today's Advanced Business Systems. Dr. Bradford's areas of expertise include enterprise resource planning systems, implementation and security issues, generalized audit software. Thanks, Jonathan. In this episode, we will explore modern ERP system selection, implementation, and challenges of today's advanced business systems. Although enterprise resource planning systems can deliver a powerful business advantage, considerable evidence suggests that, in general, ERP organizational efforts often significantly underperform against preconceived expectations. ERP organizational change is often a complex and dynamic interaction among employees, business processes, and technology. Our guest states in her book that, quote, implementing ERP is a complex, time-consuming undertaking that involves many different activities and if handled improperly, can cause the project to derail. We will further examine some tactical mechanisms to help counter potential pitfalls. Dr. Bradford is a colleague and a friend who shares a similar passion of education, teaching, learning, sharing, and contributing to our trade, which I define as ERP organizational change. And I must add that her book that we are discussing today is very well done, and I was grateful and fortunate to have had the opportunity to provide some feedback and to contribute to her book. Dr. Bradford, it's such a pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, Jonathan. All right, Dr. Bradford, let's dive in. The first question I want to ask, and I I like to ask this of many of our guests, is 
how would you define ERP for our listeners? I have it on the on the second page of my book, the fourth edition of Modern ERP that came out uh, July the 1st of last year, which is 2020. And in the book, I define it as business systems that integrate and streamline data across an organization into one complete solution that supports the needs of the entire enterprise. So that's hmm. a pretty succinct definition, I think. Dr. Bradford, clearly there's successful ERP organizational change efforts, but many of us know and many of our listeners know that, that ERP organizational change is a tough business. Failure rates are high for projects and transformations don't always succeed. You mentioned in your book that, uh, and I'm going to quote here, some of the issues encountered during implementation pertain to what's called, quotes, the soft stuff. Can you tell us and our listeners what you meant by that? How do you define the soft stuff and its role in ERP organizational change? Um, I borrowed the term soft stuff from Michael Hammer. I don't know if you've ever heard of Michael Hammer, but he was a thought leader in ERP systems way back in the 1990s. And I had the opportunity of hearing him at Sapphire, and Sapphire is SAP's big conference they have once a year. And I had the opportunity of hearing him uh, talk about reengineering and ERP implementation. So that's his term, soft stuff. But what he's referring to is the human and organizational resistance to change. And so he believes that the soft stuff is the hardest but most important problem to solve during an ERP implementation or during a digital transformation. And, and one of the things that happens is divisional managers want to protect their turf and employees are fearful or, or lack understanding of major change. So to address the soft stuff, ERP implementations must have a strong executive leadership and invest significantly in training and change management and communication. Great point. So, Dr. Bradford, as a follow-up to Jonathan's question, you mentioned that while the soft stuff is more likely to make or break an ERP implementation, the technical problems can also be a challenge. How so? And can you provide an example? Yeah, so ERP failures are still happening. We've had Target in Canada. We've had Little. We've had Revlon here in North Carolina. And we think we know how to implement an ERP system, but there's still things that can go very badly wrong. And in Chapter 6 of Modern ERP, I came up with a list of the different kinds of failures, talking about the technical issues. We can talk about a size failure. So ERP project was too large and too complex given the organization's ability. We can talk about a methodology failure, which is a failure to follow a proven implementation methodology and important activities such as things that I talk about in the same chapter, uh, cleansing data, um, knowing where your data is in the first place, data harmonization across the company, um, making sure that you load the data properly in the system. We can talk about things like all the testing that has to be done. You know, there's unit testing, there's integration testing, user acceptance testing, performance testing, data mapping testing, and I go over all of this. And, you know, doing really good testing prior to go live is so necessary because you don't want to get into a situation where you have to run a parallel implementation. You have to have your old legacy systems in place and your new shiny ERP system and be inputting transactions in both just to make sure that your ERP system is going to work after go live. You want to be confident that that ERP system is going to be working correctly, go live, and it's going to be managed. Like people like from your company, you've got to have application management services in place. So there's a lot of things that can derail an implementation. A lot of it is the soft stuff, but some of it, a lot of it is the technical as well. Great point, Dr. Bradford. Yeah, we, we talk a lot about, at least within uh, Nestle and Associates and with our clients, you know, this idea of the triad. Right. That's the yeah. people, processes, and technology. And, and you make some great points. And I, I love points that you mentioned in your book. So the soft stuff, it's the people piece, really, for the most part. It's that stuff that's a little more, um, you know, invisible, a little harder to see, maybe sometimes a little harder to pinpoint. 
But then there's also technical problems. You mentioned you know, a lot of times uh, what we've seen is perhaps an organization focuses a lot on training, but then on the tail end of that training, it, you know, as you mentioned, they they maybe skip over UAT, user acceptance testing, or perhaps they don't do a thorough CRP, conference room piloting. So they do one very important piece of, of training the end users, but then they kind of miss a step or two there. And I, I think that that's some great points that, that you mentioned and, and in your book as well. Dr. Bradford, focusing on this a little more, in your book, one of the main mentions I, I found very interesting was that your book is vendor neutral. And yeah. I wanted to see if you can take a little time to explain why this note is so important to be vendor neutral when it comes to teaching and being in the ERP space. Why was that so relevant to you and how is that so critical in the industry? So I'm teaching an ERP course in the graduate level in the MBA program here at North Carolina State University and in the undergraduate program. I have a lot of different kinds of majors, supply chain, accounting, IT, finance, everybody. And um, I, I want to teach ERP and ERP theory. I don't want to teach click here, click here, click there, click. I don't want to teach a software package. I don't think that's what I'm called to do. So yeah. we are a member of the SAP University Alliances where uh, my students have um, hands, can get hands-on training. And we, we get a client that my students can have logins to, and there's curriculum that's provided to me, and I write my own curriculum. So, you know, they, they can learn SAP in my class without my book preaching a certain ERP system. So, therefore, I have professors all over the, the world, actually, that adopt my book and are using other software packages, like Oracle NetSuite, is really great. It's, it's the number one, uh, one of the number one cloud ERP packages out there. And I, now I'm a member of the Oracle Academy, so my students get access into NetSuite as well. And that, uh, in lieu of a final, we do a, a big case that I wrote on NetSuite. And it goes through the order to cash and purchase to pay process. But you just to answer your question, I'm not really wanting to push any kind of ERP system on any professor. And I really just want to teach everything that I know about ERP systems in a book. So so that's what, what I mean by vendor neutral. It really sounds like you're focused on the principles here yeah. and that, that those yeah. are across all vendors. So that's, that's fantastic. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and the reason why I come out with a new book every four to five years is because I, I, I looked through the book. I actually added three dozen new terms in this new book. You know, because this, this field is constantly evolving, and I'm I'm constantly yeah. learning, and I'm reading all the time. And you know, I didn't have Internet of Things, I didn't have artificial intelligence. Um, those are just two that I didn't have in the book before. I could go on and on. I didn't have service level agreement in there. I didn't have application management services in there. So I have to come up with a book every four to five years. Yeah, and and Dr. Bradford, I I really appreciate the way you approach the the trade and education and training because there's actually some research that discusses how it's not just a matter of the functional training, like you said, clicking the right buttons and and just kind of going through the different screens of the different vendors, but what's really important as well is training and understanding ERP and concept and spirit. And I think that's where yeah. where you do a great job in your program. Yeah, I'm just hoping that I'm planning on if I throw out two software packages, a tier one, the biggest in the world, and, you know, NetSuite, which is for smaller companies, which is a lot more user-friendly. But, you know, they should be able to apply that knowledge to other software yeah. packages. So I don't really yeah. care yeah. what software package they're going to use when they get out. I want them to understand the principles. And one of the things that I spend a good amount of time in my class on is this ERP life cycle, the planning, everything that has yep. to be done in planning, everything that sure. has to be done in packet sure. collection, fit gap, requirements analysis, you know, everything that has to be done in implementation, what has to be done to get ready for a go live, and then let's not forget the maintenance phase, which is the longest phase there is, right? So, you know, hmm. chapters five and six really drill down on that, and then after that we get into the functionality. One of the reasons why my book is sought after by accounting, I mean, it's, it's 
MIS people, everybody, adopt, lots of professors adopt my book. But, you know, there is a chapter here on ERP security, which I don't think can be overlooked. So I learned all that from a stint that I did. I took a semester off, and I went and worked for Ernst & Young in their risk assurance division and did IT audit. So that's how I learned all mm -hmm. that to give it a right, Chapter 11. Dr. Bradford, you, you just mentioned, and, and you mentioned in your book as well, that um, every five years my goal is to publish a new edition that keeps pace with the technological advances and ERP theory and practice. Why do you even mention theory, and why as students of ERP and practitioners of ERP should we care, frankly? I mean, I, I'm a practitioner. Why should I care about theory or even research-based principles? So I'm, I'm just curious, why, why do you mention that in your book? I think what I'm talking about when I say theory, what I really meant is I, I actually bring in academic research, but I tone it down so it's not dull and boring. <laughs> but I, I bring in academic research as well and white papers from practice as well to really beef up the points that I'm trying to make in the book. So just as an example, I brought in a little bit of my research. I did actually the first dissertation there was on ERP ever. It was in 2000, so a long time ago when ERP was just starting to get big. So my dissertation was on ERP, and that's how I got into this field. And so when schools were looking at me to hire me, they thought, what if we hire her and she teaches ERP for us? And so now we're in 2021, and I'm still teaching ERP systems. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, Dr. Bradford. I, I appreciate that answer because that's exactly what I wanted our listeners to hear. I think you do a, a, in your work and, and in your book, bring in ERP research, and you incorporate that into your book and, and into your classroom. I think that's great. I think that adds a lot of value to the process of teaching ERP. So, so thank you. Fascinating. Well, that, I, I uh, just appreciate your support of my book, Jack. It's been great, and I really appreciate the fact that you were willing to read some parts of my book and give me your feedback. And you know that you're doing a good job when practitioners are interested in your work. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And and I can say this, uh, being a practitioner, there's a lot of really, really, really good practitioners out there and they work really hard. And, and I often say the folks that have the boots on the ground and, and roll up their sleeves and go to work and, and the ones that are really just really working hard for successful ERP organizational change. And I can, I think, speak on behalf of a lot of practitioners that your work is really well done. And so I, I do appreciate your book. Dr. Bradford, can you uh, can you speak a little more to this idea of tension between customization and out of the box best practices in ERP? And to frame this conversation, I want to share a quote uh, that pertains to this from your book for our listeners. In your book, you mention when a company purchases an ERP system from an enterprise software vendor, it's like buying into that vendor's view of best practice. Companies implementing ERP will end up redefining their previously fragmented, error-prone, slow, and ineffective processes to align with best practices in this software, end quote. Clearly, there's some tension here between out-of-the-box best practices and an approach that can be highly disruptive to the processes already in those organizations. So what can you tell us and share with us about this idea of balancing customization with out-of-the-box practice and solutions? Well, this gets to something that I talk about in Chapter 3, paving the cow path. What that means is cows will take the path of least resistance, right? They pave their, their path. And it's a euphemism that refers to the paths that cows tread that are not the most efficient way to get from point A to point B, but are the ones that follow the path of least resistance. So in ERP implementations, paving the cow path refers to recreating outdated, inefficient processes within the ERP systems. And this happens, Jonathan, because companies take the path of least resistance and instead of doing the hard work and actually re-engineering their current processes to best practices that are available in the ERP system, they instead decide to customize the ERP system way too much to match their broken as-is processes that are familiar to them. So all you wind up with is a very expensive what? A yeah. very expensive yeah. old process, right? 
you, you want to try to, you know, re-engineer, and that's Hammer's term. That's not my term. Michael Hammer's term. And um, re-engineering the corporation, I think, is a must-read for, for anybody. It's, it's a great book by Michael Hammer. But, you know, re-engineering was his term. And what you really want to do is examine your processes during planning. You want to map them out, map out the broken processes, map out the core processes, <laughs> map out the processes that are customer-facing. Definitely map out those and see what's wrong with them. You, you might even be able to tweak them before you actually pick up an ERP system that you're going to implement, and you're going to go with the vendor's idea of best practices that are embedded in the software instead of going and customizing the heck out of that software to match what you had before. Dr. Bradford, what, what a fantastic answer. I really appreciate the process reengineering component of fitting in best practice versus customization and the risks of over-customization. Really fantastic insight. Dr. Bradford, just curious, we're doing a lot of uh, research and, and conversation here within Nestle Associates regarding emerging technology. And in fact, we have some up and coming uh, podcasts where we will focus on emerging technologies. But do you have any thoughts on emerging technology and its place in ERP? Or is there any particular emerging technology that you're excited about in the context of ERP and, and why? You know, Everybody talks about cloud. Everybody talks about best of breed and integration. Everybody talks about mobility. And so those are kind of a given. What I'm really interested in is this Internet of Things and the sensor data and how it's integrated with ERP and then how we're going to use this data and mine it for insight using artificial intelligence, so predictive analytics. So I, I really think this the sensor data and the Internet of Things is going to be really, really big. I, that's what I'm watching. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. It's really going to be interesting to see how the Internet of Things really comes into play and, and is integrated within uh, ERP platforms. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a big deal. And I've actually included that in this edition of the book. I go over how those things are going to work. It is in this new edition. So, Dr. Bradford, I, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here with the next question. And I, I kind of want to circle back on the way I think that you approach teaching and uh, education in terms of ERP. So bear with me for a second here, because I do want to share with our listeners one of your, your papers and then provide a quote from that paper, because I, I, I think it's a, an important concept. In your book, you mention as an objective to, quote, distinguish between business process reengineering and business process improvement, end quote. You also wrote other book chapters and several articles, in fact, and papers on business process reengineering. And for our listeners, this would include a book chapter with colleague, I think it was Jingris and uh, Hornby, titled Business Process Reengineering and ERP, Weapons for the Global Organization. In addition, Dr. Bradford, you co-authored an article with Gregory Girard. The paper was called Using Process Mapping to Review Process Redesign Opportunities During ERP Planning, end quote. And, and that was actually in the Journal of Emerging Technologies in Accounting Teaching Notes in 2015. But in there, you stated, and please allow me to, uh, a moment because I want to share this with our listeners, quote, the objectives of the ELISA case are to give students experience with business process analysis by requiring them to first document and as is raw materials purchasing process during the planning for an enterprise resource planning system implementation, and then to have the students determine issues inherent in the process that will necessitate process redesign. Students will learn the difference between two types of process redesign. I think this is important. And you go on to say business process reengineering, BPR, and business process improvement, BPR. Synthesize this knowledge in order to identify process issues inherent in the case and suggest process redesigns that an ERP system will need to provide so that the purchasing process is more efficient, effective, and controlled. The case has broad appeal for faculty teaching ERP systems and or business process management, end quote. So I really wanted to share that, Dr. Bradford, because I think it's such a, a really great thing, and I think it has very practical implications in the, uh, you know, out in, in the world for practitioners such as myself. So this isn't just critical for students. This is a critical notion for experienced ERP practitioners. So one, 
Can you elaborate on understanding how process maps are so useful in the ERP implementation? And two, why do you think it's such an important idea for ERP success? Okay, so yeah, that's a big question here. Um, let me back up just a second. I know that smart companies that are trying to minimize their risk in ERP implementation are doing their due diligence during planning. And part of planning is, like we said, taking a look at current as-is business processes. And certainly the processes that I mentioned a second ago, which are customer-facing processes, core competency, high defect processes, and processes built around obsolete technology. What we're trying to do is come up with, in this exercise of mapping them out, and I have my students do this. I have them download a trial version of Microsoft Visio, and what you were mentioning was a case that I wrote about five years ago with a colleague, um, a friend of mine, actually, at Florida State University, where there was no cases to help students you know, give them a scenario that is embedded with a lot of problems in the process and have them map that out and then think about what those problems are and map out a 2B process. So that 2B process is going to be a process that you want that ERP system that you pick to support. You don't want the ERP system to support what you were doing before. You want it to move you into like this tech, it's technology enabled reengineering. You want it to bring you from point A to point B and to where you're more competitive and you're more efficient and you have better processes that are more effective. So I, I spent a whole chapter, chapter three, on common problems with business processes. And I have a, a figure three one that goes over all of these. So so things like problems with paper records and cycle times and data duplication, handoffs, inflexibility, intermediaries, lack of consequences. So using all these ideas, and there's like 20 or 30 of them, I want them to be able to read a scenario and, and the raw material purchasing process was what that case was all about. Read that scenario and pick out you know, what, what are the problems with these processes? And, and, and how can we map out and how can we re-engineer a better process that we would like our ERP system to support, our new ERP system to support? A process supporting both the functionality, it needs to be able to do purchase orders, it needs to be able to do, you know, goods receipts, but how does it do this? How does the process work? Right. Who, who are the stakeholders? Who are the people that have their hands in this process? And how does it flow from point A to point B? What is the workflow? So that's what we're talking about when we're saying re-engineering. Are there steps that can be taken out? Are there ways to do things better? So re-engineering is something that I spend a lot of time, uh, one chapter in this book about, and then I also spend one chapter in this book about how to do process mapping because I think it's really important to have a standard way to map out processes. And this is not just something that's academic. This is real world. Practitioners are spending time mapping out their processes because oftentimes they really don't know how they work. Dr. Bradford, if process mapping is so core for ERP practitioners, and I think I experienced your last answer is, is really laying that out, another related art is having and being able to build a valuable stakeholder analysis. And you mentioned in chapter three of your book, ERP in business process redesign, that, that specific chapter. In order to really understand what problems need to be changed, we need to understand what it looks like from the ground. So can you tell us more about the art of asking the right questions, the known and unknown questions, to build a valuable and useful stakeholder analysis? Yeah, so just to define stakeholder analysis, it's essential that the redesign team, whether they're doing business process reengineering, which is basically, um, it, it's not a gradual process. It's more of a dramatic, radical, fundamental redesign of business processes, which is what an ERP system usually does to a company. But business process improvement, and this was something that Jonathan asked about earlier, is more of an incremental change. So it, it's gradual sure. and evolutionary. But a stakeholder analysis, you want to do this early in any redesign 
project, you want to identify who the individuals and groups are that have the most influence over the project's success and those who will be impacted by it. And so some of the questions to ask is, who needs to provide input for this redesign project? Who benefits from changes to a new process? Who could be negatively impacted by changes to the process? And who needs to change how they complete their tasks when the process changes? And then, of course, the soft stuff, who will need training to effectively use the new process? So those are just some of the questions that need to be asked in a stakeholder analysis. Failure to plan for these key stakeholders can cause a lot of issues, you know, including like things like lost customers, wasted money, and even damage to a company's reputation. Good point. So obviously, Dr. Bradford, your book is Modern ERP, Select, Implement, and Use Today's Advanced Business Systems. Can you share for our listeners what you would consider, maybe just short answer, what would you consider to be some of the key steps in ERP package selection? Well, forming a, an ERP selection team is really important, right? The team should be led yeah. by the project manager and executive sponsor and include subject matter experts. So that's important. And not to get you know too big, maybe six to eight people, so decisions can be made more effectively and efficiently. Um, you know, requirements of gathering. I do consulting, and I serve as expert witness in lawsuits. So I've done, like, three of them, building cases for these um, lawsuits on either side, the, you know, the defense or, or the, prosec you know, the prosecution. But, you know, requirements of gathering is a big deal, and that's not soft stuff. That is hardcore figuring out what is the functionality that, an ERP system needs to support, right? In the area of purchasing, in the area of accounting, in the area of HR. And so if you miss a requirement, a major requirement, that can cause problems during the implementation. I mean, all of a sudden, you're trying to finish a project in, in, in six months, it's gonna go to nine months because you've left out a major requirement. And so that's very important. Of course, trying to figure out, okay, are we going to do a family suite? So are we going to get all our modules that we need from one ERP vendor? Or are we going to do best of breed? So that's a big deal, and it's getting to be a, a bigger deal because there's so many niche cloud vendors out there that you might want yeah. to use. For instance, Salesforce is so big in the CRM area, and it, it might benefit a company to – to integrate with that cloud, with, you know, with Salesforce, to use Salesforce versus implementing the CRM module that comes with their main family suite. So you have to think about those things as well. Demo days are really important. You don't want to mess up a demo day, right? Because yeah. you don't want right. them coming in and just doing a sales pitch. You, you need to send them a script ahead of time and say, this is what you, we want you to go over and we want you to go over it with non-customized software. We want to see what your system can do out of the box. And, Jack, I can go on and on. How much more do you want me to do? <laughs> no, that <laughs> is great. Reference checks are important. You know, <laughs> and then you've also, got, yeah. you've also got to deal with a system integrator selection, if that's yeah. not going to be the vendor. No, that's great, Dr. Bradford. I, I think you're illustrating your point, and something that I certainly emphasize, and a point that you emphasize in your book is, Really, there's 95 plus, just in discrete manufacturing alone, there's 95 or so ERP vendors in that space. So I think that there's really one right fit for every organization. And so you got to understand your business model. And then once you understand your business model, because that helps steer you to the right platform. And then, you know, like you said, you really need to be clear on the functionality that you need within that platform. And so, of course, all all discrete manufacturing vendors and ERP vendors, right? They can all take orders. They can all take sales orders, but often they do right. it in very different, very different ways. And so that needs to be considered. But, uh, and, and then once you understand the modeling and the business requirements, and then like you said, there's all sorts of other factors that go into that selection process. So I think your point, <laughs> your point is well taken. Well, you know, I started teaching this like 20 years ago. I kind of like, Best of breed was something that you want to steer away from, but it's getting to be more and more popular, especially with yeah. all these new vendors popping up that can do what you want with less money than perhaps your on-premise solution that you might have. Right. 
and more efficiently and, 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 and more user friendly. Yeah. Another great point. Yeah, because, you know, there's ERP vendors that maybe to a certain degree try to be all things to all people and maybe not yeah. quite as industry specific. But then, like you said, yeah. then there, there's very specific industry uh, ERP players and you need to have that conversation. And then, of course, there's maybe the, you know, a combination of a best in breed where you combine different solutions. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to, to talk about the fact that I really drill down on the pros and cons of each of these scenarios in mm -hmm. Chapter 5 of my book when I go over planning and package selection. So I have pros for the best of breed and cons for the best of breed, and then I've got a whole section on pros and cons. So a company has to think about do the advantages of doing best of breed outweigh the disadvantages. Dr. Bradford, you co-authored a paper with a colleague, Florin, I believe it was, that was really interesting to me, and it's called Examining the Role of Innovation Diffusion Factors on the Implementation Success of Enterprise Resource Planning Systems. I know that seems like a mouthful, but it was, the paper was really interesting. But you published that in the International Journal of Accounting Systems, in, and it was back in 2003, but you stated, quote, Results reveal that top management support and training are positively related to user satisfaction, while perceived complexity of ERP and competitive pressure show a negative relationship. Consensus in organizational objectives and competitive pressure are positively associated with perceived organizational performance. So, Dr. Bradford, based on your work, your experience, your research to date, if you had to pick just three critical influences or, as you know, success factors, what it's typically called in the research field, that are required to realize ERP organizational change success, what would you say they are? So I'm going to put you on the spot. Your top three critical yeah. influences for ERP success, what would they be? So I've learned a lot since 2003. I, everything in that paper is still valid. I would like to suggest that I might have three different ones than in the paper sure. now. Um, sure. the, the top management support positioning the project as a strategic business initiative is very important. It's not just changing technology. It is changing your business processes. And so the focus is on process, right? And have passionate, committed leadership is very important. And process owners being the key decision makers is important as well. And then the last thing I would say, and I know this is number four, is don't stint on change management. Organizational change management is very important, and that's getting back to the soft step that we talked about earlier. So powerful, Dr. Bradford. Um, this is a question we often ask on this podcast. In conclusion here, Dr. Bradford, if, if you had to distill down your years of being an educator, a researcher, and a practitioner, what words of advice or way of seeing would you give our fellow practitioners, our listeners, and business leaders in terms of ensuring and supporting successful ERP organizational change and transformation? So I've been researching and teaching in ERP systems since 2000. So while I've seen change, there's still a lot of stayed the same. A lot of the issues that we've seen throughout the years having to do with failures. We thought that, you know, we knew everything there was to do about an ERP implementation, and we've got methodologies to make sure that uh, implementations run smoothly. But, you know, it really is a lot of focus on risk management. So I would say that risk management is really important, and I would also say how do you continue to achieve an ROI? How do you continue to achieve competitiveness with your system? How do you grow after the live? How, you don't want to stay stagnant. You don't want to say, okay, we've got this ERP system in, and it's working, and everything's fine. But you've got to keep on growing, and you've got to keep on adding, and you've got to figure out when you're going to do those upgrades and when it's necessary to be done with, you know, a module on-premise and go to the cloud. And, and are you sure that you're accessible for mobility? And when are you going to start thinking about artificial intelligence and analytics? So the act of go live is my focus at this point. Yeah, that's a good point, Dr. Bradford. I think that, you know, when you quote unquote hit that switch, really that's where a lot of the work really starts, right? Because there is this idea of this post productivity dip. And I think that's a, that's a given. So knowing how to maneuver and work your way through that post go live productivity dip is important. 
and, and I think organizations need to be prepared for that. But that's a great point. Well, not you just know, that, but adding value after go live, right? Exactly. I mean, the yeah. dip is going to be there. The dip is going to be there. It might be 30 days. It might be 60 days. It might be 90 days. But you're going to get right. right, hopefully. Yep. But how do you how do you you know make sure that you had baseline measures, hopefully during planning, and that went into your business case. You need to have mm-hmm. a center of excellence after go live that's making sure that you're hitting those projections of improvements in like cycle times and and inventory levels, decreasing your inventory levels and uh, rationalization of your suppliers and all this kind of stuff. So you want to make sure that you're circling back around and you're achieving what you thought you were going to achieve or you projected that you were going to achieve during planning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great, great point. You know, in ERP implementation, the go live, you know, that's the wedding, right? That's the <laughs> wedding. Okay, but, but after go live is the marriage. You need to be prepared for that marriage. Yeah. Dr. Bradford, I've heard a lot of analogies there with the go live and the pre and the post, but that's a new one. So that's a good one. Thanks. <laughs> Very <laughs> illustrative. I think I just made that up on the spot. <laughs> I've got lots that I can share with you, but probably not on, on the air here. But uh, that was a funny one. That was good. Dr. Bradford, thank you so much for your time today. As a friend and colleague, we appreciate your time and insight. It was a very fun conversation. I know that for me, your passion for your trade, education, and teaching is pretty self-evident. So thank you again, and, and be well. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I enjoyed speaking with you all today about my favorite topic, ERP system. Please join us in our next episode as we discuss training evaluation with Dr. Jim Kirkpatrick. Dr. Kirkpatrick is a senior consultant for Kirkpatrick Partners. He is a thought leader in training evaluation and the creator of the New World Kirkpatrick model. Jim consults for Fortune 500 companies around the world and has written three books with his father, Don Kirkpatrick, the creator of the Kirkpatrick Four Levels. Additionally, he has written three new books with his business partner, Wendy, Kirkpatrick Then and Now, Training on Trial, and The Brunei Window Washer, Bringing Business Partnership to Life. Join us again next week. Listeners, thank you for joining us on today's episode. We are incredibly excited and grateful to have friends, colleagues, and mentors join us on our podcast. We have an incredible lineup of guests, including ERP and organizational change speakers, authors, professors, researchers, pioneers in the field, practitioners, PE partners, business executives, ERP vendors, and organizational stakeholders. We invite you to leave us feedback and a review because we want to make this the most useful and insightful podcast you listen to, and we need your help to do so. Thank you, listeners, for being with us again this week as we seek to, one, promote, connect, and foster relationships in the ERP organizational change community, two, contribute to the field of ERP organizational change, and three, bring research and practice closer together. Please join us again next week as we discuss the latest ERP organizational change research, practice, and stories. Our podcast will draw on knowledge from extensive research, collaborative learning, and practitioner expertise and experience. From everyone here on the team, Jack and myself, uh, we wish you a great week, and we hope to see you again soon on another episode. Hashtag the ERP Organizational Change Journal. Have a fantastic week. Bye for now. Thank you.